welcome friends we are going with a very basic topic today that is physiology of menstrual cycle once you understand this physiology very nicely then rest all abnormalities like primary amenorrhea secondary amenorrhea or other abnormalities of the menstrual cycle will be very easy to understand so let's concentrate and understand what is the basic physiology and how menstrual cycle takes place what is the mean duration of menstrual cycle mean is 28 days only in 15% of the female it, the cycle is actually 28 days otherwise the range is 21 to 35 days and that is quite okay if the cycle is regular happening every month this much difference is considered as normal what is the average duration of menses the period is from 3 days to 8 days what is the normal estimated blood loss it is considered as 30 ml throughout the period what does ovulation uh, when does ovulation occur usually day 14th on a regular cycle which is of 21 28 days after 32 to 36 hours after the mid cycle lh surge or onset of the surge and 10 to 12, 10 to 12 hours before or after the lh peak there would be ovulation if the cycles are irregular then in that case Ovulation occurs 14 days before the first day of menses. So always remember that the first phase that is the proliferative or follicular phase can vary but the last luteal phase remains constant of almost 14 days. What regulates the phases of menstrual cycle and ovulation? It is the HPO axis, hypothalamo, pituitary, ovarian axis and the hormonal balance in between this axis which then acts on the uterus and a patent genital tract leads to visible menses. So this is required for having normal menses that is HPO uterine axis with patent genital tract. These changes they start taking place at menarche that is the age of puberty and end point is menarche. On an average, the age of menarche is 12.7 years. Once it starts at menarche, then menstrual cycle, they continue till menopause and on an average, the age is 51 years. Now, how does this begin? Till puberty, GnRx secretions are not in pulsatile form. At puberty, at the menarche, the hypothalamus secretes GnRx in a pulsatile manner. This GnRH activity is first evident at puberty. Follicular phase GnRH pulses occur hourly and in luteal phase GnRH pulses occur every 90 minutes. Loss of pulsatility, if GnRH is given continuously then there would be down regulation of pituitary receptors. They will not be responsive and the secretions of gonadotrophins they will decrease. You understand this? Because of the pulsatile nature, the hormone is there in the blood, the hormone is not there or very low count, very low concentration. This is the pulsatile nature. If there is continuous presence of GnRH, then naturally there is down regulation of the pituitary and gonadotrophins that is FSH and LH will not be secreted. Release of GnRH is modulated by negative feedback from the steroids that is estrogen and progesterone and LH and FSH levels. Now, we will first, as we have seen the importance of HPO axis, then acting on the uterus and the genital tract. Hypothalamus secretes GnRH, which goes and acts on the anterior pituitary. It secretes FSH and LH, which goes and acts on the ovary, estrogen and progesterone, according to the phase. That goes and acts on the uterus. Estrogen causes proliferative changes in the endometrium. And when progesterone comes in, it acts on the estrogen primed endometrium and leads to secretory changes. It, the hormones present in the blood, they have negative feedback on the GnRH from hypothalamus. Thus, the concentration of GnRH goes down. There is decreased FSH and LH that leads to decrease in estrogen and progesterone. Thus, there is withdrawal of these hormones and that cannot sustain the proliferated endometrium. And then there is shedding of this endometrium. This was in short. We are seeing all these changes in detail. 
ovulation divides the menstrual cycle into early follicular phase, late follicular phase when the follicle is developing, then there is ovulation that is ovulatory phase and after ovulation there is luteal phase and at the same time in the uterus till ovulation it is called as proliferative phase when the endometrium is proliferating and once there is formation of corpus luteum the second half of the cycle is called as secretory phase. Now let's see the changes. In follicular phase it begins with menses on day one of the menstrual cycle and it ends with ovulation. There is recruitment of follicle, dominant follicle from the cohort once there is FSH secretion. So FSH leads to maturation of the ovarian cohort follicle and recruitment only once reaches the maturity. FSH selects this primordial follicle. Oocyte arrested in the diplotene stage of first meiotic division. So in the primordial follicle, the oocyte is arrested in the first meiotic division. They are surrounded by granulosa cells. Inner layer is called as granulosa cells and the outer layer is called as theca cells. So these are all follicular cells. Inner granulosa, outer theca. Then the prim primary follicle forms. Oocyte is surrounded by single layer of granulosa cell, basement membrane and theca cell. That is called as primary follicle. It continues and secondary follicle or preantral follicle is formed. It is actually the oocyte surrounded by zona pellucida and now several layers of granulosa and theca cells are present. Then there is formation of tertiary or antral follicle. It's a secondary follicle accumulate fluid in a cavity that is the antrum. Oocyte is eccentric in position. It has come exactly at the edge of that and it is surrounded by granulosa cells that is called as cumulus euphorus. Means you understand it is about to leave the ovary now. It is about to rupture. A dominant follicle gets selected on day 5 to 7. Selection depends on the intrinsic capacity of the follicle to synthesize estrogen. As the follicle matures, there is increased estrogen and decreased FSH. That is the negative feedback on the pituitary. The follicle with the highest number of FSH receptors continue to thrive and the other follicles that, that were recruited, they become atretic. Now FSH does recruitment. It has mitogenic effect. It increases the number of granulosa cells as well as it increases FSH receptors. It stimulates aromatase activity that is conversion of androgen into estrogen. Naturally occurring estrogens are estrone, estradiol and they increase the LH receptors. Now what does this estrogen do? It acts synergetically with FSH to induce LH receptors and it induces FSH receptors in granulosa and theca cells. LH, it acts on theca cell. There is uptake of cholesterol and LDL and formation of androstenedion and testosterone. These are androgens. They finally get aromatized to form estrogen. There are other two hormones which are also important. They play a role in folliculogenesis. One is inhibin. It is a local peptide in the follicular fluid. It has negative feedback on pituitary FSH like estrogen. And it locally enhances LH induced androstenedion production. The other one is activin. It is also found in follicular fluid. It is either from the granulosa cell or from pituitary. It stimulates FSH induced estrogen production. It increases the gonadotropin receptors and it decreases androgen. In ovulatory phase, there is negative feedback on the pituitary. Increase estradiol because of increased FSH and inhibin. It has negative feedback on pituitary and it decreases the FSH. This mechanism operates since childhood. And what are the positive feedback mechanisms on pituitary which starts at puberty? Increase estradiol reaching a threshold concentration has positive feedback on the pituitary that causes LH surge. So this activity is not existent before puberty and this LH surge leads to progesterone secretion. Progesterone has positive feedback on pituitary which increases FSH. Please understand this. 
that pre ovulatory phase or around ovulation lh as it goes on increasing it is causing secretion of progesterone and this progesterone has positive feedback on fs fsh that leads to a second peak or that leads to a again a surge of fsh that leads to estrogen increase levels and thus the mucus becomes spin barkite or that typical pre ovulatory mucus because of sudden increase or maximum increase in estrogen hormones in pre ovulatory phase this is mid cycle surge lh surge it la it lasts for 48 hours ovulation occurs after 32 to 36 hours of surge very important mcq asked again and again after the surge after the beginning of the surge almost it the ovulation takes place after 32 to 36 hours but if the question is asked in this way that after how many hours of lh peak then the answer is 10 to 12 hours lh peak leads to rapid fall in estradiol level and this may lead to mid cycle spotting you know many of the females will give this typical history that around 14th and 15th day of the cycle they have one or two spots that is bleeding minimum bleeding or spotting that is because of as there is lh peak that decreases estrogen levels which has increased before now they are decreased and that causes mid cycle spotting triggers and this activity of lh peak it triggers the resumption of meiosis you remember the follicle it is arrested in first meiotic division and that division completes only after the sperm entry but resumption of meiosis it starts resumption of that meiotic process which gets completed if there is sperm entry so lh surge has action that it triggers the resumption of meiosis it affects the follicular wall and follicle ruptures and there is formation of corpus luteum granulosa cells they get luteinized and there starts progesterone synthesis now ovulation mechanism of follicle rupture what are the mechanism how actually the follicle gets ruptured there is increase in uh, follicular pressure it changes in composition of the antral fluid increase colloid osmotic pressure again there is enzymatic rupture of the follicular wall lh and fsh they act on the granulosa cells granulosa cells secrete plasminogen activator there is increased plasmin that leads to increased fibrinolytic activity that leads to breakdown of follicular wall and this again the peak of lh it releases certain prostaglandins plus increased plasminogen activators and they cause sudden my the uh, spasm or contraction of the micromusculature there is increased pgf2 alpha increased lysosome under the follicular wall and that causes break breaking of that wall and release of the follicle after the follicle gets released that means after the ovulation the phase starts is called as 14 days uh, uh, luteal phase and this phase lasts for 14 days formation of the corpus luteum after ovulation the point of rupture in the follicle wall seals vascular capillaries cross the basement membrane and grow into the granulosa cells and there is increased availability of ldl cholesterol so lh now leads to increase ldl binding to receptors increase 3 alpha hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase activity and increase progesterone corpus luteum once formed it secretes four hormones progesterone we all know but please remember it also secretes estrogen inhibin and in case of pregnancy it secretes relaxin this can be a mcq again that what are the hormones secreted by corpus luteum progesterone estrogen inhibin and relaxin corpus luteum goes on maturing and it has its maximum maturity by day 22nd of a 28 days regular cycle so from ovulation 7 to 9 days or the 9th day is the peak of its maturity so that way of 22nd day of the cycle maintenance by lh the corpus luteum is maintained in non pregnant female by lh levels and if the female conceives then the maintenance of the corpus luteum is by hcg and then this corpus luteum keeps secreting progesterone 
till placenta takes over that is almost around 12 to 14 weeks corpus luteum 9 or 11 days and then after that it forms into corpus albicans and around 14 days it starts degenerating in luteal phase there is marked increase in progesterone secretion now what does this progesterone do it acts it suppresses the follicle follicular maturation on the ipsilateral ovary there is thermogenic activity that's why increased basal body temperature we have seen in bbt that is very basal body temperature that after ovulation the second phase there is increase in the body temperature and then it acts on the endometrium causing maturation or secretory activity progesterone peak is eight days after ovulation very important MCQ that immediately after ovulation don't think that there would be progesterone peak and the cervical mucus will become thick it doesn't happen progesterone secretion starts increasing but the peak is almost on day 22nd that is eight days after ovulation that is why in infertility also when we do progesterone levels we do it on day 21 or 22nd corpus luteum which is secreting progesterone is sustained by LH it loses its sensitivity to gonadotrophins and gradually there is luteolysis. There is decreased production of estrogen and progesterone and this withdrawal of these two hormones will lead to vasoconstriction and this vasoconstriction of those tortuous spiral arterioles which are uh, taking place in the endometrium that will lead to desquamation of the endometrium and then it will get shed off as menses. In luteal phase, decrease estrogen, decrease progesterone. Now, as these hormones are getting withdrawal, naturally a signal would be sent to the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus will perceive that these steroids are less in the body and hypothalamus will secrete GnRH. GnRH will go and act on the pituitary and then gradually there would be secretion of FSH, then leading to LH. So, this will begin the next menstrual cycle. If pregnancy occurs, then there is the trophoblast of trophoblastic tissue of the pregnancy. They keep releasing HCG. This HCG maintains the corpus luteum. It doesn't allow it to get degenerated. And this corpus luteum keeps on secreting progesterone, estrogen in some amount. So there is no withdrawal of these steroid hormones from the body. And thus maintenance of corpus luteum and maintenance of pregnancy takes place. And there is no menstruation in case of pregnancy. Endometrial changes during the menstrual cycle. Now we are focusing on uterine changes. That means those endometrial changes. Till now we have seen the ovarian cycle. Endometrial uh, endometrium goes uh, through two phases first is proliferative and second is secretory basal layer of the endometrium which is actually very adjacent to the myometrium is unresponsive to hormonal stimulation so it remains intact throughout the menstrual cycle what changes is actually the functional layer of the endometrium and that is composed of two layers that is zona compacta and zona spongiosa so these are the layers which are actually going these undergoing these changes in the follicle follicular or proliferative phase estrogen will have mitotic activity in the glands and the stroma endometrium will increase in the thickness from 2 to 8 millimeter when we measure it that we measure it from the basalis of this side to the basalis of that side of the uterine wall on ultrasound in luteal or secretory phase there is progesterone which is acting on this endometrium Mitotic activity is severely restricted. Endometrial glands produce and then secrete glycogen rich vacuoles. So these endometrial glands which show vacuoles is the first sign of ovulation. So this vacuole formation is the first sign that ovulation has taken place. This is again an important MCQ. Then the stromal edema, stromal cell enlargement will take place. Spiral arterioles will develop. They will lengthen in this proliferative endometrium and then they coil the uh, growth is so much that it cannot get accommodated so they coil and there is spiraling once estrogen and progesterone is withdrawn at the end of the secretory phase there is vasoconstriction and there is desquamation of the endometrium the external hallmark of the menstrual cycle just before menses the endometrium is infiltrated with leukocytes 
Prostaglandins are maximal in the endometrium just before the menses. Prostaglandins leads to constriction of these spiral arterioles. Because of vasoconstriction, there is ischemia and ischemia leads to desquamation. Then once this, is st this starts shedding off, there is relaxation and that relaxation of the arteries after vasoconstriction leads to bleeding and this tissue which is uh, desquamated comes out in the form of mixture of blood and tissue and that is what we call it as menstrual blood. So to summarize, let's go through this chart. In menstruation, there is ovarian cycle and uterine changes. In ovarian cycle, the cycle begins with FSH. Again, important MCQ that the ovarian cycle starts with which hormone? It starts with FSH. FSH secreted by the anterior pituitary goes and acts on the granulosa cells in the ovary. Granulosa cells are those cells inner layer of the follicle, of graphene follicle. Granulosa cells secrete estrogen and some amount of inhibin B. Estrogen has negative feedback on FSH. Estrogen has action on uterus that it starts the uterine changes in first follicular phase or proliferative phase that it goes and acts on the endometrium and cause proliferation, increase mitotic activity here. Inhibin has negative feedback on FSH. So these two having negative feedback and FSH will lead to decrease FSH level. Main action of estrogen it, it leads to LH secretion. So now as soon as granulosa cells starts forming estrogen, LH levels have started going up. LH will do three acts. LH will act on the granulosa cells and will lead to progesterone secretion. This progesterone is less in amount but it starts, the secretion starts and this progesterone has positive feedback effect on FSH. So because of the presence of FSH, uh, because of presence of progesterone, FSH will rise before ovulation. This increase FSH will lead to again, it will act on the granular cell, will lead to estrogen formation. So there would be sudden increase in estrogen levels before ovulation, pre-ovulatory phase that will cause thickening and spin barkite in the cervical mucus. LH has other action that is it will act on the theca cells and theca cell will release androstenedions and testosterone that is androgens and they will get aromat aromatized to form estrogen. As the LH is increasing in size gradually there would be surge which is 32 to 36 hours before ovulation, then LH will have peak. After LH peak, 10 to 12 hours after, there would be ovulation. That means release of the ova from the ovary. And there would be formation of corpus luteum. This corpus luteum keeps secreting progesterone, estrogen and now inhibit A. Progesterone will go and act on the uterus the endometrium which is estrogen primed will undergo now secretory changes and there would be vacuole formation that is the first sign and gradually all secretions will accumulate so secretory phase will continue here. Presence of progesterone and estrogen will cause negative feedback on GnRH as the progesterone goes on increasing when the peak activity of corpus luteum is on day 22nd. Peak level that will give rise to negative feedback. Negative feedback to hypothalamus will decrease the GnRH secretion thus decreasing FSH and LH level. Once these gonadotrophs are low there would be withdrawal of these hormones that is estrogen and progesterone and once there is withdrawal of these hormones that will lead to vasoconstriction. The proliferative endometrium, proliferated endometrium will not be supported by the vessels. That would be vasoconstriction and shedding of these tissue which has grown. Where vessels will get relaxed, released later, relaxed and that will lead to bleeding. So there would be uh, the blood plus tissue will be 
it will come out in the form of menstrual blood and that is called as visible menses. So this is the whole cycle which is very important to you to understand, to understand the defect in this. I hope this chart will help you to understand everything very clearly. Thank you.